you won't hear anything. Yeah. Okay, let us know when we're on. Stand by and go ahead, please. Welcome to the Serious Security Seminar for March 30th, 2016. Today I'm honored to introduce uh, Professor Chris Kanich, who comes to us from the University of Illinois at Chicago, where he does work in uh, techno-social aspects of security and privacy. He is trained as a computer scientist, but looks a lot at uh, where security and privacy issues uh, go beyond what we can simply address <coughs> using technical means. Uh, he got his PhD at the University of California, San Diego, where he worked with uh, Professor Stefan Savage, uh, recent recipient of the ACM Infosys Award. And uh, however, before he went to UCSD, Chris was an undergraduate here at Purdue. So for any of you who are undergraduates, uh, you know, you do really well, study well in security, and look where you can end up. So with that, Chris. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Chris. Yeah, I, if, if you do all of those things, as Chris mentioned, you could very happily come back to Purdue. I'm very, very happy to be back here today uh, to give you this talk that I've uh, entitled <coughs> uh, Bottom Line Security. So. Uh, as Chris mentioned, I'm, I'm here from uh, beautiful Chicago, just a couple hours away, uh, where I've been uh, as an assistant professor since 2012. And this talk is really about, we're going to look at the bottom line that's involved in security. Like what's really going to be the most meaningful thing that we can look at at a socio-technical level, just zoom out as far as we possibly can from the things that we're focusing on at a technical level and really see those impacts uh, at, a, at a broader level. So uh, one really, really quick uh, fun exercise that I like to do, you know, when you do intro to computing type classes is you know, if somebody, if an attacker, if a, if a clever attacker sees this door with all of these really, really nasty locks on it, what is the clever attacker going to do when they are faced with this type of, of defense? Anybody? Break the door. What's that? Break the door. Break the door. Break the door is definitely one. Uh, easy thing to say is, oh, instead of looking at those locks, we're just going to go after that hinge, right? The clever attacker is not going to worry about your defense because their goal is not like, oh, I really, really want to be the first guy to break this amazing pin pad lock. They want to get to what's behind that door. So they can attack the hinge on that door. They don't even have to attack the door itself. They really just want to get into that uh, system. And so this is one point that I, I like to try to drive home where defense is harder than offense. We, we, we need to place a perimeter around what we're looking at and say, we, what is it that we really want to protect? Because we put these mechanisms up, but it's not the security mechanism itself that the attacker is interested in. They're interested in the thing that you're actually trying to protect. So a little bit of what I've done in the past uh, while I was a PhD student at UC San Diego was look at what these attackers are actually trying to get. And one, one easy thing that we can say there is that oh, a lot of attackers uh, nowadays on the internet are looking to make money. They're looking to turn some technical uh, insight that they have, some hard work, some intelligence they have, into an attack that can make them money. And one uh, you know, postulate you could make is say, listen, in order to create better security, I'm going to find out what attackers want and I'm going to try to prevent them from getting to what they want. Right? If an attacker wants money and they're going to use spam to do it, we can either filter the spam and say, oh, you know, there's a billions and billions of messages, we can do our best to make sure those messages don't get through, or we can say, well, we're going to make it harder for people that are sending spam to take credit card uh, transactions. And that is going to be just as or possibly more effective than doing something that, at a purely technical level trying to prevent that spam. Because it's not that the spammers want to subvert your filter, they just want to make, uh, make a dollar. So this is a, a matter of minimizing the upside to the attacker. That's one way that we can affect our bottom line security. But uh, there's so much more going on than just spam. There's so much go more going on than just these uh, specific types of attacks. There's so much. It's not just a matter of, oh, there's a door or a lock or a hinge or a window. Uh, when you see the interconnectedness that we have online today, there, 
you see ridiculous numbers. You see that Facebook analyzes graphs that have a trillion different edges in them. And that sounds really, really cool. It's really great to be able to do this data mining at that level. But when you start thinking with this adversarial mindset, you start thinking about the security aspects of this. You say, uh-oh, like there are um, billions of different vectors that I need to be able to defend against and try to say, oh, is there a way for them to make money this way? Is there a way for them to gain an advantage that way? It becomes really, really tricky. Uh, so the attacker ends up at a uh, advantage in this situation where they are just going to be in a much better situation than we are as the defenders. There's more of them than there are of us, and this becomes uh, a resource constraint, a hard resource constraint. We, as researchers, as people who are trying to do cybersecurity, can only devote so much time to uh, preventing this attack or preventing that attack or preventing the next one. We're fundamentally limited in this way. So while, what we've done in the past and what we do a lot is we say, okay, these are the attacks that an attacker is going to try to do. They're going to try to infect a machine. They're going to try to exploit a vulnerability. They're going to try to knock a machine offline via a DDoS attack. And we can understand a lot about how they do that, why they do that, and minimize how much uh, they, how much success that they're going to get. But what I posit is that the objective function that we really care about, uh, oh, I'm looking at the wrong. So the objective function that we really care about is that we want to actually minimize how much harm comes to the defenders, how much harm comes to us. And if we, if we look at our objective function that way and say, this is what we're going to minimize, we're going to minimize the harm that comes to the good guys, not necessarily at a purely technical level, but at this larger socio-technical level, uh, then you're going to end up with better bottom line uh, security. So I'm going to go over a few projects that we've done over the past couple of years that start trying to take... Uh, take a crack at understanding how much of that harm is coming to users so that we can use that to build uh, effective defenses that give us uh, uh, the right uh, inputs to our objective function. So the first thing we're going to look at here is quantifying the harm that comes to our users. Again, we're looking at things in terms of dollars uh, lost, days, time that's lost, and data that is lost. This one we're going to look primarily at uh, time, but we're also going to be able to turn time into money with a, a couple you know, back of the envelope style uh, calculations. So we're going to look at a, a crime, a relatively benign, relatively like marginal, but still nonetheless uh, tangible and substantial, and definitely in terms of quantity, cybercrime called typo squatting. So typo squatting is when you know, I decide like, oh, I uh, want a lot of people to visit my website uh, and I don't really care if they want to get to me. I just know that people are fallible and if somebody decides they want to go to Facebook, they might instead type in uh, F-A-E-C-B-O-O-K instead of F-A-C-E-B-O-O-K. So I know that as the cyber criminal, I know that that could possibly happen. And I'm going to take advantage of that to, say, serve malware, to serve a bunch of ads that that person doesn't want to see. Uh, and there's been a lot of research trying to say, okay, we need to detect this, we need to prevent this, we need to uh, make sure that people are not the victims of this typo squatting attack. And so what I, what I want to look at, what my research group has looked at on this is, okay, well, how can we model this as a harmful event? And how can we get a better understanding of how much of that harm comes to the users who are the victims of this cybercrime? And there's one, one way that you can look at this is the harm that comes to the, um, the provider of the service, the site that, used, that might have gotten a visitor but then didn't. So they lose a visitor to their website. Another one is I am a user who comes to that website and I, instead of going to where I wanted to go, I went to someplace else. So in this case, uh, the user typed something in incorrectly. They might end up at an, a browser error page because the domain hadn't been registered yet. They might end up at a site that's just full of ads. And the really nasty one that we uh, worry about here is that they might end up at a phishing page or a page that serves them malware because this is somebody who wanted a visitor to come to their website and not necessarily a legitimate visitor that actually wanted to engage in business with that person who was impersonating Facebook. And so what would usually happen in, in this model is the person goes 
to that website, there's a reasonable chance, probably hopefully a very high chance that they realize they were at the wrong website, they correct their mistake, and they end up at uh, facebook.com. What we really want to happen is we want to make sure that we minimize the attacks that happen here, that, that final uh, option, right, where somebody goes to a site that has malware on it or that has phishing on it, that is definitely a bad thing. We, we could put some dollar value on that. But what, what we found in a previous research that I'm not going to talk about too much today, we looked at typo squatting through lots and lots of different websites, just trying to see, looking at millions and millions of domains, trying to find how prevalent is typo squatting both on very popular domains, but also on less popular sites. There's, the long tail of lots and lots of websites, you know, smaller sites, local sites, how much typo squatting is being perpetrated by and on those sites. We actually found that there aren't that many, uh, the prevalence of malice, like phishing or malware, uh, on these sites which are performing the typo squatting was less common than in some uh, random choice of reasonably popular sites. So if anybody's familiar with the Alexa 1 million, we found that there's a higher prevalence of malware in the Alexa 1 million, the 1 million most popular sites on the internet, versus uh, the sites which were doing this typo squatting. So what we found was mainly what these sites are doing is they're uh, monetizing sites via uh, throwing a bunch of ads in front of people. It's very, very rare for these sites to actually be doing something malicious, which makes sense. So what we're looking at here is how much malice, is, and there's not going to be too much of this high value problem. Th those things get stomped out relatively quickly. The main uh, harm uh, we posit here on the user side is that lost time that you get simply from being a victim of this attack. So what we were able to do in this situation uh, was what we want to say is well, we need to find some better way to look at uh, these attacks and find them actually happening. And where this attack is simply uh, like I have on this slide here where there's a person who goes to uh, website A because they made a mistake, they correct that mistake, and then they uh, end up going to uh, website B. So we built this, uh, we built a model to look at the behavior. We, we built a model out of that idea that this is how people are going to end up going to uh, these types of websites. So we said, listen, we, we have access to a very large number of anonymized uh, web, uh, a very large amount of anonymized web traffic. And we're simply going to say, let's look at every single visit that any of these users does to a home page of any old website, either trying to go to something that doesn't exist at all or trying to go to a website that is relatively close in the uh, lexicographic distance to the actual site that somebody wanted to go to. And so we looked for uh, three times in, in our data set of, uh, I don't remember exactly what our uh, uh, billions of web requests. Uh, so we had a, a data set of a few billion different web requests. We looked at, okay, in all of those, how many of them were 30, 33 seconds or less apart? Uh, how many of them were relatively close together uh, lexicographically? And happened a reasonable number of times so that we can actually see that this is a trend as opposed to just a spurious uh, one-off uh, situation. And so with this uh, just model, we're just describing what we're looking for. And then we, we looked through our data set of about a billion different views. And we were able to find a very large number of typo domains, not purely based on the fact that they were uh, uh, close together lexicographically, but any sort of event there. We filtered it to that lexicographic distance to make the problem a little bit easier for us. And we were actually able to find not only the fact that some, somebody visited, say, eba.com and then went to ebay.com with a 90% probability, but also say, OK, well, even if something is lexicographically similar to something else, we can lower our false positive rate by saying, oh, even though these are close together and somebody visits this site and there's a reasonable chance that they're going to finish visit this other site right after they visit this first one, they aren't a typo squad of each other because they don't happen uh, in this correlated fashion. So a purely passive or a purely um, uh, you know, data-driven, so a purely just looking at the lexicographic data, you wouldn't be able to find this uh, behavioral uh, correlation that we found in this, uh, in this data set. 
So we were once we have this idea of what are these different typo squats that actually happen, not only do we have the idea that, oh, we actually do see this eba.com and this ebay.com and lots of users that went to this site, there's a very, very high chance that they meant to go to this other site. We can say we have these typo squatting events and we have the time frame that they happen. So we can actually say at time t equals zero, the user typed this thing in. At time t equals one, the user typed this next thing in to go to a different site and they, they ended up uh, where they wanted to or they didn't and they had to go and look at some other site. So we were able to question, yes? Yeah. How do you collect this data? Uh, this is uh, anonymized data we got on a tap on a moderate sized uh, university network. I, I can answer more questions at that point, but this is uh, anonymized, IRB approved, uh, privacy preserving uh, research with best practices both on the security and the privacy side. But that's a very, very important question. Thank you for uh, asking me on that. Uh, so uh, looking at these typos. So now we have these 34,000 different events that we're looking at. And we want to say, okay, like, how do these actually work? Are there different motifs that we can look at and understand what is happening in this situation? So one of them we see uh, are adversarial registrations. So we uh, characterize adversarial registrations as ones where the uh, initial mistype of some domain is not connected in any way through, they're not registered together, they don't forward to each other. Uh, they aren't registered by a brand protection agency. Uh, these are sites that are going to have a reasonable, uh, a non-negligible chance of being malicious, of simply being a parked site full of ads. We also looked at cooperative registrations, which are the ones where you see brand protection or simply owning multiple sites that could be typos of each other and using those to say, this is cooperative. What those sites will usually do, they might say, oh, uh, you got to the site in error, please click here to go to the real yahoo.com instead of yahoo.com. Uh, or they simply do, do that automatically through your, your browser. And then the third, uh, also very common uh, instance here, is that the domain simply isn't registered. Uh, so looking at these three different types of typos, you can see a user could go through any one of these three different uh, typos depending on what it was they typed incorrectly. So we can see here we've got this blue line uh, is the CDF of the delay from getting from uh, what you mistyped to what you were trying to get to. If you were going through a cooperative registration, the, the uh, checkered line is adversarial registrations and the red line is unregistered domain. So you typed in something that just simply didn't exist, your browser gave you an error page and you moved on to where you're trying to go to. The first thing that we see in this data is that there's a huge difference between these cooperative registrations and everything else. And this makes sense. When a computer can correct this uh, mistake for you, it can do so very, very quickly. Uh, the, the long tail there where 80% of them happen immediately, the, the long tail ends up being where there is something that is registered, but it uh, requires the user to do some sort of uh, input, some sort of interaction, and that causes something that's cooperative to still cause uh, some delay. Uh, the, uh, so that number, there's a very big difference between those two sets. But actually, when we look at the difference between the adversarial registrations and things that are simply unregistered, there is a very small difference between those two sets. So this is basically saying uh, if somebody pops up a whole bunch of ads in front of a user, or if, if someone just pops up an error message, one of those isn't causing a user to waste more time than the other one. This isn't uh, a harmful, this isn't a substantially damaging attack to just throw a bunch of ads in front of somebody. They just, they will find the site that they're going to at roughly the same, in roughly the same amount of time. The other, uh, <coughs> situation that we're going to look at. Not only are we looking at how long it takes a user to get to the site that they wanted to get to, but we also want to look at uh, the success rate of the user finding what they're trying to get to. I'm trying to find out how often will the user who mistypes this domain, because with, with our behavior, with our intent inference technique that we talked about earlier, we can know that there's a really, really strong chance that somebody who went to this super unpopular website that is a mistype of a relatively popular website, we knew that they were trying to get to uh, the intended website. We know what they were trying to do. 
So we can say, oh, in the, cha in the situations where they didn't get to where they were trying to go, uh, we want to get there, uh, or we want to find out what that success rate is. <coughs> so uh, this uh, distribution, uh, I'm a little bit uh, behind where I need to be. Okay, so uh, let me back up just one quick moment. Uh, so this distribution is actually the full per, uh, this is a scatter plot of the full per pair uh, domain uh, success rate for uh, each individual domain that we saw in our data set, both in terms of how often that typo happened and uh, how much delay, uh, what's the average delay caused by that, that typo. And when we look at the average unregistered typo delay versus the average uh, adversarial delay, we see that there's a very large distribution, or I'm sorry, this is just the unregistered typo delay. There's a very large distribution where users will actually get to the site that they wanted to get to faster if they went to a adversarial site versus a uh, unregistered site. So there, there's a lot happening here that's not really substantially harmful to a user. If we look at the success rate difference between the two, uh, we see that there's a, a much larger chance that users will have a lower success rate getting to the site that they intended to get to. Uh, this actually, I'm sorry, this is the loss rate, so the opposite thereof. So there's a large number of people that aren't getting to the site that they intended to get to, but there is a, uh, most of them are getting there relatively roughly in, with the same amount of success. So you are losing visitors, but there isn't a very, very substantial amount coming in there. And now that we've uh, looked at the loss, we looked at the harm in this situation from the time lost for the user and the visitors lost for the website. And we can actually turn those values into a loss of revenue, a loss of value, a loss of economic value for the uh, people in this uh, situation. So we want to uh, change those in. Uh, so if we want to turn lost visitors into uh, lost revenue, we can talk about the lost cost to acquire a user. So if I'm going to advertise online, I'm going to have there there are there are studies that'll tell you oh to acquire a customer for a certain type of business, it's going to cost you this much money to put display ads in front of somebody and actually get somebody to show up and start using your website. Uh, if we use those studies and those values to turn lost visitors into lost value, we see that, oh, we're losing uh, <coughs> between $1.8 and $13 million in prospective visitors. So this, this is what the entire uh, United States population would have had to do, uh, would lose in uh, economic value because they weren't able to attract those visitors to their website. So this is the drag on the economy uh, as a whole, right? Our multi-trillion dollar economy, the drag here is on the two to $13 million uh, level. So this is not a large number in, in the aggregate. And if we also look at the time lost for the users, so users who are a victim of this attack lose time. They waste time that they could have spent you know, visiting that website that they really wanted to, to go visit. And depending on what averages we're looking at, we actually see that if users get to their intended site faster, then they've saved money. So the loss here is actually this negative value. You see that there's a negative $4.5 million loss because these people are perpetrating this attack. And it could go up to uh, $40 million, depending on what uh, average, what uh, estimate you're, we're using here of lost productivity. And we turned that uh, time value into uh, an economic value, into a money value, simply using uh, US average wage. That's, you know, these are very, very rough ideas, but we're still getting an order of magnitude idea. Is this a billion dollar problem? Absolutely not. No, it's a maybe a million dollar, a ten million dollar problem. But in the aggregate of the entire uh, U.S. economy that we're looking at here, that becomes relatively uh, small potatoes. And so another interesting aspect we can look at here is uh, what is the negative externality uh, ratio for defenders. So if I was going to instead register these websites myself and prevent these these uh, malicious people from taking these uh, 
at taking these visitors from me, wasting these people's time. My negative externality ratio here is something like five to one, which is lower than nonviolent crime. So this is not as bad societally, economically, as something like white collar crime. And it's nowhere near as bad as something like um, you know, violent crime, something where there's a huge negative externality for society because there are people that are perpetrating this attack. And you can also contrast this with spam, where the, uh, the negative externality ratio for spam is actually really, really high. So because there's so much, so many people that are trying to get these unsolicited messages into people's uh, mailboxes, there's a hundred to one ratio there, where you know for every one dollar that a spammer gains because they were able to get you to buy their product, a hundred dollars were being spent on anti-spam or lost productivity because I had to filter through this email message, all, all, all of that stuff. So that's a very significant cost. So in terms of the in the grand scheme of which cyber crimes are more damaging, the uh, something like spam comes out way, way ahead of something like, like typo squatting. So yes, uh, but maybe because the adversary is still not using their uh, the thing that is available to them using typo squatting to the fullest extent. While in spam, they already understand they are doing that for like twenty years, and so they understand where how the money works. But here, they haven't yet made themselves. Uh, good enough. So th I think that's a that's a really interesting point. I think most of all, uh, to me, and that there's a there's there's this value extraction step. There's this I, I call it like the last mile of cybercrime. That you can do a lot of things online, but the the hardest step in a lot of these schemes is turning something digital into some actual economic value in your hand. That's something that's very very hard. Another aspect to this that I like to call it the the moral flexibility argument. So the attackers could extract more value if they were more morally flexible. They would they would make a lot more money if they put a bunch of ad, they put a bunch of uh, root kits or drive-by downloads or other nasty stuff on those typo squatting web pages. But uh, it's going to be less common for somebody to do that because these people are they're making some amount of money. They're speculating. They are not you know evil cyber criminals out to extract every sent from you, regardless of how much it hurts you. Uh, these, are, these are people that are doing online marketing. They aren't really interested in breaking into your computer. But that's a, that's a good point. They could make more money. Um, any chance we're comparing apples to oranges vir by virtue of the fact that the data you based your typo squatting on is in a university environment where students are fairly enlightened versus a greater group where you look at the spamming, where you can have a lot of people across a social, economic, around right. the world situation. And, and as he mentioned, maybe the bad guys haven't figured out that type of setting could be pretty lucrative with the right audience. Yeah, so our ecological validity is limited in that case. We are not necessarily looking at a full cross section of uh, United States internet users. We are looking at a relatively uh, distorted uh, subset of those users. And so I, I definitely think that that could be the, the case that these users are savvier, they can type something in faster. So if we looked at differently abled users, we looked at old, like an older population, the delay might end up uh, much, much longer. I don't have some slides in here, but I do have slides where we, we split out um, mobile versus uh, non-mobile, so desktops, laptops. And there, there's a very uh, recognizable difference, but it was not immense. So you can use that as a little bit of a proxy for you know, differently abled users. I know I'm probably roughly as fast as maybe a differently abled person when I'm on my phone versus if they were in front of their own like, typical device. So I definitely see that as something that would change our numbers, but I would not worry too much about it because we're looking at something that ends up as orders of magnitude, like if the delay went from an extra 10 seconds to an extra 50 seconds, I don't think that would turn this million dollar problem into a billion dollar problem. But I, that's also really, really on point. Thank you for bringing that up. So the next uh, pro project I'm going to talk about here is looking at the ecosystem harm. So uh, within the on the internet, one thing that we all love is free stuff. 
Like we get so much free stuff on the internet. We get free email, we get free social networking, we get free news, we get free information, we get all this great stuff. And one way that this is supported is this uh, trick called affiliate marketing. A lot of online publishing, say that there's this website I love called uh, thesweethome.com. It's a, a great place to go to see you know, what is the one best uh, juicer to buy uh, and what the way that this site works, they, they don't serve ads. They do all of their reviews totally without, you know, taking a bunch of payola. This site makes their money by saying, okay, when you click on uh, this button right here that says go buy this amazing food processor at Amazon, and if you go to Amazon and you go buy that uh, pro product, you will be giving a kickback to uh, that website. Uh, because you bought it after clicking through on that ad. That is affiliate marketing in general. When you convert, when you go and buy something, they go back and pay the website that drove that traffic to the online retailer. So the, the ecosystem here is web users want free stuff, uh, publishers want to uh, give away free stuff, but also still monetize the effort and the value and all everything that goes into creating that free product. And then retailers are saying, oh, I want more people to come to my website. I want more people to buy things. And so I'm going to pay publishers to provide pre free things in, uh, in the hopes that one of these users are going to come and buy my product. So affiliate marketing fraud here uh, is uh, is an attack that has minimal uh, technological ingenuity involved. Uh, but what it does here, so the basic idea, I'll talk about it in a minute, is that somebody can swoop in and say, oh, even though I'm not advertising, even though I'm not uh, giving you all this information about food processors, I still want, whenever you go to Amazon to buy something, I want to receive that kickback from Amazon because I drove the traffic to Amazon. Uh, and so if this uh, attack were really widespread, it would endanger this ecosystem that we have where you can provide free content without putting a bunch of noisy ads in front of people, uh, do actually some good effort and give that to people. And the question is, you know, this could be a very widespread attack. We can, there are other uh, uh, research results showing that this happens pretty often on the web. There are a lot of people that are trying to uh, perform affiliate marketing fraud, but we don't actually know, are, are they making money? Uh, and this is that, uh, how much success the attacker is getting. The other question is, uh, is this endangering, excuse me, our, our free content? Is somebody who is putting the effort in to be a legitimate affiliate marketer, are they losing out because of the attacks that are happening? And if they're not losing out, then oh, you can worry about, oh, maybe Amazon is paying more than they need to to uh, attract these users. but. Uh, we'll let Amazon deal with Amazon's problem. We're going to see whether this is going to endanger the, the small publishers that are relying on affiliate marketing to provide these free uh, services. So the basic idea for uh, affiliate marketing fraud is I, I go to Amazon. Uh, after So I visited uh, the sweethome.com. I found out, oh, this uh, food processor is awesome. I really want to buy it. And I went over there. I clicked through, and now if I buy this or anything at Amazon in the next 24 hours, that uh, advertiser, that uh, affiliate will receive some you know, 0.1 to 3% uh, commission for causing that sale. If instead of immediately buying it, I just go and uh, visit a whole bunch of different web pages, what one of those web pages could do if they're a little bit unscrupulous is they could say, well, I'm going to have some invisible little pixel load up the Amazon web page, you know, in the background, in some small iframe, and put my own token in there saying, oh, I'm the person who drove traffic to Amazon. If, if this person buys anything from Amazon in the next uh, 24 hours, then I get the value, even though I wasn't putting it forward to uh, you know, drive that traffic. I was just saying, oh, I know that there's a visitor to my website. I'm going to trick their computer into dropping this cookie on their machine to get that value instead of allowing that legitimate marketer to do so. So they drop their cookie. I eventually go back and buy it. And even though the legitimate affiliate marketer is the one that inspired me to buy it, this uh, fraudster is the one that would be deriving that value, some you know, small percentage of that order total. So again, we're going to use the same data set, a nice uh, anonymized uh, web visit data set that we have there. 
uh, looking at 164 different affiliate marketing programs. Uh, my fantastic uh, PhD student Peter Snyder went through and manually collected you know, what it is that each of these uh, affiliate marketing systems are using for keeping track of the fact that a user clicked through. We built a, a fraud classifier, and so we're trying to extrapolate how many people are actually clicking through and having these cookies drop, the, both the legitimate ones and the fraudulent ones, and then try and say, okay, what we want to find is the specific situation where somebody visited a legitimate marketer, and we'll determine whether it's a legitimate marketer or not, whether the user continued to perform activities on that website, whether it's Amazon or GoDaddy or whoever's doing the affiliate marketing. Say, okay, these are the users that were legitimately driven to that website. They saw it, they were interacting with it. We're gonna presume that means that they wanted to be there. Uh, versus the illegitimate ones where we see the page opens, but there's a small or 0% ch chance that the user actually continues to uh, interact with that page. That's our, that's our uh, indicator that that person was actually driven there fraudulently. If they go there and then immediately vi uh, leave, we're saying that was probably, uh, probably fraudulent. So we want to say, okay, how often does somebody visit the legitimate uh, advertiser, not purchase something, and then go ahead and visit the uh, illegitimate uh, fraudster and then go and purchase something. Because that's actually where value is being pulled out of that affiliate marketer's uh, pocket. If it weren't for that, then this isn't actually causing harm in the ecosystem. It isn't actually endangering uh, affiliate marketing from the uh, publisher's point of view. So what we found in our data set was you know, about 15,000 different uh, referrals at Amazon, definitely the, the big, big, big one in here that everybody else's relative noise uh, compared to Amazon. We found, you know, if we actually just, just look at those referrals, there's a, a very substantial set, right? You know, two, uh, 3,000 out of 13,000 is a pretty big number in terms of honest versus, versus fraudulent. But if we actually look at the conversion events, there were uh, these 15,000 different conversion events. And again, this is where we, uh, we're going to say when we see somebody click on the checkout bu button, that's going to push them through to a uh, SSL site. We can't see anything about whether they actually chose to buy that, but we're going to use that as a rough proxy for somebody was going was probably going to go and buy this. There's a reasonable chance that they did that. So we just make the simplifying assumption that that is a conversion event that we want to track. And we, we found out of the 15,000 conversion events, uh, 174 of them were fraudulent. So this was somebody who was able to successfully, uh, say, defraud Amazon, but none out of those 15,600 were actually stolen. We never saw somebody go to a legitimate affiliate marketer uh, and then uh, have that cookie stolen by some fraudulent marketer and then uh, create value for themselves. So this is defrauding the provider, but it's not defrauding the uh, the publisher. So even though there's a large number of these fraudulent uh, transactions, we're still not seeing a substantial amount that are causing damage for that ecosystem of how can you trust that affiliate marketing will uh, give you a fair shake. And this is also, it's easier to look at, it's better for us to look at that because Amazon, all these uh, providers that are providing these affiliate marketing programs, they have a lot more visibility than we do as passive uh, network monitors. They have a lot more that they could do to detect those fraudulent uh, transactions. So those 174 we see there, we have no idea whether any of those were paid out by Amazon. They can actually take a look and say, oh, none of these people are looking at the same object. They're not buying the thing that they click through on. There's a lot of ways that Amazon at all can minimize the impact of those fraudulent transactions. So the, the last project I'm going to talk about here uh, is looking into, you know, if we know how much harm comes to users, what good is that, right? We don't necessarily, we, we can't immediately do something simply knowing, oh, this isn't that big a problem. Maybe when we do find something that is a bigger problem, how can we use that insight to give us an idea of what the heck is going on and, and make uh, our cyber uh, security a little bit better? So in this uh, project, we looked at something that we call credential-based privilege ex escalation. So one uh, common uh, situation is, oh, if I create a, an account at almost anything that's not uh, 
say an online bank or an email service or Facebook, the only thing that I need in order to reset the password to that service is uh, access to the email account. Like if you had access to my personal email account, you'd be able to get into my Amazon account, you'd be able to get into uh, you know, all sorts of different accounts that I have because your email is just a default password reset. So having access to the email is roughly equivalent to having access to every single account that the user runs through that account. And cyber criminals can sell these accounts, can sell access to them. You can sell access to say that Amazon account, and then that uh, user, that cyber criminal can say, oh, I'm gonna use this uh, stored credit card number, excuse me, to say buy um, Amazon e-gift cards, and I'm gonna go and sell those on Craigslist or some other random place, and I'll get and I'll launder that uh, in that way. See, this is relatively common with uh, Apple, so you have like iTunes gift cards, you've got Spotify premium, there's uh, Walmart has Walmart e-gift cards, Amazon has these e-gift cards. These are relatively popular in the, in the cyber criminal underground because you can turn access to that account into laundered money in your own personal account because you sold some credit, uh, some, some uh, value. You said, oh, I'm gonna go on Craigslist, I'm gonna say I'm selling e-gift cards that are worth $50, but I'll uh, take 25 and says, oh, you know, I want to go buy something. They've effectively laundered that 25, like, clean dollars out, and the person who bought that may or may not uh, buy something in time before that uh, credit gets shut down. So in this situation, we know that this is a bad thing. We know that if somebody gets into your uh, account, they're going to be able to monetize it in uh, every which way that, we, that we've found by looking at cybercrime over the past uh, several years. And our goal in this situation is to say, like, let's use this idea of how much harm comes to the user to communicate to them that this is a bad thing and help them practice better cybersecurity uh, hygiene. So what we've built uh, in this situation uh, is a tool which will allow you to uh, receive a, a personalized audit of how valuable your email account is to a cyber criminal attacker. And so the vulnerability uh, intrinsic in this idea of having a primary email account can be shown to the user not just uh, as some statistic that shows up in an infographic, but as a personalized piece of data saying, not just any account, not just the average account, but your account. Your account is worth this much to a, uh, to a cyber criminal. So we, we went through a decent, uh, process here trying to uh, gather a bunch of data. This one is a, uh, isn't using the same data set we had before, so this is something that's active. We have a, a website, uh, cloudsweeper.cs.uic.edu, uh, where uh, we have a few different research projects that we ask people to uh, participate in if they, if they want to see what's going on here. And so what this uh, project, what this specific account theft audit tool will do is it will say, okay, well, we're going to uh, find which account, which free accounts you have access to, uh, we know what their password reset uh, situations are. We say, oh, well, if you if you your account was stolen, then an attacker would be able to access this, 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 and this. And we also know from communicating with one of our some of our friends that uh, spend time cruising the cyber criminal underground. How much are those accounts going for? We got a uh, uh, ads for oh, we're, we'll sell Spotify accounts for three dollars and Amazon accounts for ten dollars and. Apple accounts for $20, something like that. We say, oh, well, if you have that account, then what would it? What would the value of somebody parting out your account, just taking it and saying, oh, I'm gonna sell you know, Chris's Apple account, Chris's Amazon account, I'm gonna sell all of those. How much could I uh, make in that uh, situation? Just show that to the user. So the user's seeing two primary pieces of information here. One, they're seeing exactly how many different accounts that they are running through that one uh, primary email account, like how, uh, how much of their life revolves around the fact that they have access to it. And the other thing we're showing them is how much uh, value the cyber criminal could make by stealing it and then going and selling all that information. And so we, uh, we tracked uh, 1,400 different account types. We used a, a great uh, service, more of a, it's a public service called, there's a plain text offenders is this great website that'll simply uh, publish like a name and shame of saying, here's all of the services that will send you your password in the clear after, like through email. And so we were able to bootstrap off of that and collect quite a bit of 
uh, quite a bit of data there. We don't have too much of the underground information, and a lot of it we have now is uh, a few years old. So that's more of a rough estimate than a you know very scientifically rigorous uh, estimate of the value in those uh, accounts. Uh, and when we looked at about uh, just short of 10,000 different people using that uh, service, we found that you know the average email account that uh, somebody was using at this service had about a value of about $14, and the maximum we really saw was uh, $40 uh, would be the value to an attacker if they were to uh, take over this account. And uh, something we saw was really interesting. There, there's a few people commenting on this on you know online news sites. One of the one of the most interesting ones I saw was somebody saying, "Wow, my account is worth two dollars and thirty cents to a cyber criminal. That is almost nothing, especially compared to how much I would lose if I lost access to this account." It, it's a it's this uh, negative externality ratio that I was talking about earlier on. This person, you know, they just intuitively saw this is a really bad situation where somebody can you know, they just make like chump change compared to how much harm comes to comes to me. And so one thing that we did uh, as part of this, not really as part of the study, but more of the, the public service aspect of it, as soon as we popped up the, you know, this is how much your account is worth, here's how many account, how many other accounts you run through this email, we say, you know, what can you do? You can use a strong password, you can use two-factor authentication, try and use that teachable moment idea to in, help people do better cybersecurity. We've got another project we're starting right now, we're actually gonna try and, uh, judge how effective that, uh, that messaging is. Uh, but that's something that is uh, just getting spun up right now. So uh, to conclude, what I really like to look at and what I think should be looked at is the cost of cybercrime in terms of time lost, money lost, data lost. And if we can look at these and actually provide some reasonable, we don't have to have you know, down to the dollars and cents. But if we can just get orders of magnitude so that we can do a very rough apples to apples comparison between completely different technical attacks, we can say, uh, well, we can improve our allocation of our scarce effort to say we're only going, we're going to primarily focus on defending against the things that are most harmful to people. And if we know, if we can make that measurement, then we can say, oh, we've actually improved outcomes. We have provided some positive impact so that people are better off. We can empirically say people are better off. There are fewer attacks that are causing real world harm. Uh, and we can show that, which is super helpful, both uh, within the socio-technical aspect, but also somebody who's working on a purely technical uh, defense. They can use something that uh, looks at it this way to say, oh, uh, by deploying this service, I can save people this many uh, days, this many dollars, this much data. Uh, and we can also improve communication because if we can actually say this is how harmful this is to you, not in terms of thousands of machines compromised or a 10 gigabit DDoS attack, but in terms of you could lose this much money, you could lose this much time, then you're going to be able to create a more effective uh, cybersecurity regime. So thank you for that and I will be very happy to take any questions. So I had one question. Yeah, so yeah. did you, for the second uh, aspect, did you mm -hmm. convey the results to Amazon to see what they have to say? Uh, not unless Amazon is reading the workshop on the economic information security now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Presumably some somebody there is, but whether they would yeah. take that back to you. I have a question. In the, the first section, you really didn't look mm -hmm. at the the costs associated with malware was that because you were able to that this typo squatting that just wasn't a common use of it uh, yeah so the, the we had a usenic security paper in 2014 where we were we looked at a lot of the typo squatting in the in the long tail and so we looked at both on on popular sites and then on less popular sites and the occurrence of malware based on um, something like Google Safe Browsing was practically non-existent. So that's, that's why we didn't include that as a factor in, our, in that aggregate value at the end. Uh, w once things become that rare, it becomes very hard to factor them into the aggregate. That's a, so one thing that we haven't looked at yet 
but we are, or what we're trying to look at right now is cross brand um, typo squatting. So something where like there is damage to a specific uh, actor because somebody else was typo squatting on, on their name. So it's one thing if some, uh, so there, there's somebody who put a bunch of ads in front of a user, they're, they're just trying to make a buck by putting these ads in front of a user. But if somebody is actually saying, oh, well, I'm Burger King and I'm gonna typo squat on, you know, westlafayettemcdonalds.com, there's a, a significant uh, potential cost there uh, if they are able to do that successfully. Uh, and so that's something that we're looking at right now where the, that's another factor in that value, that damage that, that comes in. Uh, where instead of an, uh, an attacker that's just doing this generic attack, where it's something that's actually targeted, saying, I'm going to use your brand to uh, bring value to my uh, specific brand, where there's a much clearer idea of malice than a generic you know, uh, domain parker. Okay, well, I'd like to thank this. Thank you very much.